Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andrew Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello and welcome listeners to a very special holiday episode. And today we're going to be delving into a topic that's probably near and dear to my own heart. Um, as I attempt to find the essence of the holidays. And we're going to be exploring the true meaning and experiences surrounding this joyous season and how you may be able to cope, especially when you're grieving. Hello, I'm Anne, your host. And today we have a very special guest joining us, Matthew Brackett. I'd like to say he's a remarkable individual with a diverse background of international experience, and he lends his expertise and unique perspective to not only leadership, education, and spirituality. Matthew's journey has taken him across many continents, serving once as a Catholic priest and even a staff officer and chaplain in the United States Navy. He's also known for his ability to guide and inspire. He's also spent over three decades in the field of personal, professional, and intercultural leadership development. He's also got a wicked humor. So now you're beginning to see a little bit more and understand, listeners, why I'm eager to be delving into this topic with him. But there's a wee bit more I want to share about Matthew. You see, he's not only a versatile coach, advisor, mentor, educator, and confidant. Matthew says he's like a human version of a sophisticated Swiss army knife. We'll hear more of that in a moment. He's now turned his attention and offers invaluable support to senior leaders and helps them navigate the complexities of their life so that they can lead, love, and live better lives. You may have heard him on our show before, but but today we'll be diving into. You may have heard him on our show before, and he is a frequent guest on many, many others' podcasts. And we'll be diving into some of this important topic that I'm certain will resonate deeply with you all during the holiday season. So let's get started, shall we? Welcome, Matthew, back to the show. I'm honored to have you here today. Bringing your leadership expertise as well as donning your priest hat. Hopefully, that's okay with you. Yes, we'll wear all those different hats for the, for the good of your audience, of course. And I, I really, I have to say that I love your bio. Um, well, my, you made my bio sound so good. The way you, uh, what, however you crafted it, and with your wonderful accent. So <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> I just enjoyed listening to that. It made me sound a lot better. So thank you. Oh, I, I'll send you a copy with my invoice later, Matthew, if you like. Thank so you. as I alluded to the fact your journey began um, quite some time ago, didn't it? As you, that was your first career, you went into the priesthood. And now you have a, a you're currently in leadership. How difficult or different was the transition for you? Oh boy, <laughs> I think, and I would invite your guests, or your not your guests, your your listeners, to go back to the podcast that we recorded before, 
because it had to do a lot with grief and a little bit more about my story about identity and transition. Transition, I think for, for us as human beings, but for, and for me, it's it's been very challenging. It's surely been an adventure. I've been, and I, I don't think I would train it, trade it for anything. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but at the same time, I've gotten so many, I've grown so much and so many lessons, so much knowledge of just the human person, so much, I think I've grown more empathetic, more understanding, the depth of my knowledge around people and what transition means in so many ways for people. So very enriching, but as many enriching things, very challenging. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole thing around identity, right? Which we go through as, as human beings and professional identity, personal identity. And that's been part of the journey as well. And Christmas, I have to say Christmas, this period is in the holiday season, the Christmas season is very special to me because there's some very important life, life moments during this time. Mm -hmm. I decided to go to seminary when I was 18 during this period. So, and I, I received what they would call to receive the uniform, joined, officially joined the seminary at the first days of January of 1992. Hey. And, and then I was, I received ordination as a Catholic priest on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2002. And then my father passed away on December 20th, two years ago, in 2021. So, so Christmas season has a lot of, there's a, there's a lot there of just my own, my own personal and life decisions and journey. Oh my goodness, Matthew. Well, I'm sorry to hear that your father died just two years ago. What a yes. tender time for you, because it's these transitions, as you mentioned, uh, regarding coming from the priesthood out into the the corporate world, really. Although I guess you could say the Catholic Church is yes. corporate in a but sense, more similar, isn't it? More simple, similar than people would think. But yes, it's, it's a large, yeah. complex organization like many others. Yes. So just the very fact that Christmas, as you say, holds a very special time for you because of all these pieces in your life. And now your dad chose to leave this world around December. That's right. I'm not sure how much of a choice he had, but yes. Well, but, yeah. no, I, I, I kind of believe we choose our death dates. We just, okay. they're not revealed to us. That's, right. That's a whole other conversation. That is another conversation. And it was, it was very special because I was able to be with him. And because of my missionary work, you know, I hadn't, when my mother passed away 10 years ago, I wasn't, I hadn't seen her for two years. And so, uh, and so I really wasn't able to, uh, to see her before, before she lost consciousness. Um, so it was very special to be able to be with my father uh, during his last days of illness and to accompany him, to even to, even though I was not in ministry, to offer him um, blessings, the communion, what we would call last rites, because I, I can do that in, in, in the cause of close death. So, so yes. So it was very, very meaningful at the same time as, as difficult. As but thank well. you, Anne. I know you. I know that this conversation, it's about other aspects of Christmas. It is indeed. However, you mentioned the tra transitions are difficult to navigate and they can be even harder when you're grieving, which I'm certain you're starting out on a new trajectory in your own life. And then there's the grief on top. Yes. So to me, you understand only too well from being a priest and now experiencing it, what people may be feeling around this time of year as this may be their first Christmas mm. without their loved one. Uh, so they are transitioning into a new way of life. Mm. Thank you, Andy. And it's so true. You know, Christmas is there's so much lights and joy and parties and festivities. You know, whether it be Christmas, the Hanukkah, um, different holidays, the season of light, really. Um, but at the same time, there's so many people that are going through their first holiday season without a loved one. Mm -hmm. And it's about being, and you're creating awareness around that. You know, that maybe not everyone's feeling the, the sense of joy that uh, exactly that, that is generally around in the, in the environment 
But there's a people can be going through a lot of quiet loss and quiet pain and grief. And yet, and I remember even as a priest, I mean, in, in some countries, in the, you know, in contrast to the way I'm not sure how it is in Canada, but in the United States, you know, where funerals you can plan them out over time. But in a lot of other countries, someone passes away, and within 48 hours, they're usually buried. So I've oh. celebrated funerals on Christmas Day. I've oh, wow. well on Christmas Eve, right? And so that's that's definitely been part of of what I've done. You know, being very close to suffering families during in the holiday season mm -hmm. how have you counseled them um if that's been the case where the, their loved one died so suddenly and buried on christmas eve yes and on christmas day i remember celebrating a funeral in chile on christmas morning yes and then so it's you know, and this maybe goes into, maybe if you allow me to talk a little bit about even just the Christmas story. And this is whether you believe in the Christmas story or not, but I think there's some very powerful messages. And one is actually, in my own personal journey, I began to discover um, two things about Christmas. One, it's a time of connection, okay, or the holiday season, it's a time of connection. And in the, in the Christian tradition, right, it's it's really the, the connection of, of, you know, of God, the divine who connects in such a way with us as human beings. And I think there's such a powerful and humbling message here. Because in, in so many centuries of human, or thousands of years of human existence, it was always about the human being trying to relate with the divine, with the gods, or with God, with the transcendent, sort of always on this journey to try to relate and to please and to, and to create relationships and to appease, whatever it was. But the christmas story it's all it's the opposite it's about how god connects with us and becomes one of us whether you believe that or not but i think that's just a powerful such a powerful message and it's it's so power it's so humble and so silent you know just the story of bethlehem that it's almost difficult to believe that it's god but that's the way god is and that's the way god surprises us mm -hmm. and i think there's so many lessons there that we could talk about of that of the humility of and simplicity of the Christmas story, which I think is, has been been lost in all the, the the ways that we can celebrate the festivities. Yeah. And it, it almost because yeah, it, but when now when the other message around its connection, but the other thing that I would often preach about is is the Christmas crisis. If we look at the story of Christmas, it's one crisis after another. Right? And and I'll I'll lay the and so this would be the message that I would bring to people who were grieving or suffering. It was really about how Jesus, uh, uh, how Mary and Joseph dealt with so much tragedy and difficulty. Because if we think about the, you know, in, in the, the, the traditional Christmas stories, Mary who was, had decided to be a virgin her whole life, right? And that's changed by divine intervention, right? If okay. we just follow the lines of the gospel story, right? Yeah. Through the Holy Spirit that she's, Right, and so again, there's a loss there. She, she, her plan was another one, and all of a sudden she's conceiving, you know, she's expecting, and it's and it's very confusing because in Jewish tradition, well, someone who's you know she wasn't married, so this is just a total crisis and tragedy, right? She's supposed to be stoned to death, okay, right, for what's happening, and so so that's one thing, and then and just how Mary deals with it and how Joseph feels, they deal with it with such dignity and elegance. You know, and and then and then they have to go to Bethlehem because the 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 king or the emperor is doing a census, which is it's an interesting kind of you know it's he just wants to know how well how many people are in his you know how many people he rules over, so it's sort of yeah. an ego an ego thing. But there's probably there was a logistical thing and practical thing to just to just for the census, and so they have to go you know in the final weeks of pregnancy they have to go on a donkey from their town of Nazareth to Bethlehem. Okay, again, very difficult. And then they get to Bethlehem and they don't find any room to stay, right? And Joseph being such a good man, he obviously wants to find a dignified place for his for his wife. And you know, at, at this time they are they are espoused, maybe not officially married, according to the Jewish tradition. There's a, it's a process that they okay. that they go through from, from espousal to marriage. And then and they have to, um, I can't remember the exact timeline. But anyways, he, he's looking for a place and there's no room anywhere. Bethlehem is just full of people that are there for the census. And 
and he can't find any place dignified place and so they an innkeeper or someone however the story goes you know there's some stables that are that are have some room that they can you know put some hay together and stay there and that's that's what happens so that no place to stay she ends up giving birth in a stable on a cold winter night i'm not, I'm not sure how cold it gets in bethlehem but i know it's not it's not summertime so it can mm -hmm. be chilly and so that's and that, that's and then a few days later the herod who's very who's heard about the this birth of of this baby who's supposedly the messiah sees this baby as a threat and sends his soldiers out to kill all babies under two years of age. Mm. You know, and so Joseph and Mary have to find a way to escape to Egypt. And, you know, in the back roads and at night and so that they won't be seen and so that they can escape. So if we really look at the, the, at the truth of the Christmas story, while well, there's so much beauty and love to it, but there's, there's so much crisis to the story. And I think what's amazing is, and the message is, how Mary and Joseph dealt with crisis. Mm. And that really God, who became one of us in, in such tragic and difficult circumstances, and met us where we were at. So I think that's part of just the, the, the beauty and the, the depth of the Christmas message. Yeah, what I heard there was a teaching about expectations, how we can get all bent out of shape. We imagine Christmas is going to go this way and this way, and then a crisis, not quite the way you described it in, in your story of um, the birth of Jesus. But to us, it's a big deal because we want everything to be perfect. So... When I was listening to you, that's what came to my mind, how we can view our crisis when compared to what perhaps other people are going through, mm. rather than thinking of our own crisis, whatever yeah. that may be around the holidays. I thank you for, for bringing up the story because it is... Touching on my question, the essence of Christmas and the simplicity, the simplicity of that time of year. However, we have made it through generations, just believe, and probably Hollywood. We've now, how do we reconnect to that? that true meaning of the holiday amidst the noise of commercialism and material expectations, Matthew. Right. I think it's really, it's a very personal decision. It's a decision of each family. Okay. Now, it, you know, having been, having come from an American family, you're from the States and okay. somewhat familiar with Canada as well, where you're from or where you live. And traditions don't, aren't deeply rooted, but, if, you know, having lived in Europe, you know, in continental Europe or Eastern Europe or, or Latin America, where I live now, again, some tra traditions go for centuries. And I think it's about really trying to value those those traditions because there's a lot of r rituals and practices that families or cultures have mm -hmm. that keep us grounded. And it's very important for each family to decide what are our holiday traditions that help us go to the meaning of whatever the season is that we're celebrating. Because we already know with commercialism and capitalism, everything, it's 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 gonna bring us in another direction, just naturally. Yeah. There's a lot of inertia there. And it's not our place here to say whether that's right or wrong. The fact is that's just the way it is. It is. But yes. the, the, the the but your point is well, what's the essence? And it's really it's a it has to be a personal decision and a decision of each family. Because it's about bringing your children up and, and what's our what's our holiday traditions? that we do together you know in, in some countries you know i lived in colombia south america so they have the nine days before christmas where they again there's a very social element people get together but they do their prayers they do their rituals and then they have a wonderful meal and parties in mexico it's what they call the posada which is they sort of re-imitate 
Joseph and Mary going door to door and being refused entrance and then finding okay. a place where they can where they can find posada, which is lodging. You know, and then the party begins and the festivities and the famous piñata and all this other stuff. You know, and and in in Europe again, each country has their also their traditions. So I think it's you know with Google nowadays, you can Google all kinds of traditions and say, all right, I like this. I want this tradition to be part of our family. Something okay. that we do, right? And we have the Advent wreath and many Christian traditions, which is just the four weeks of preparation for for Christmas. You know, but and then I wouldn't. I'm not too familiar with again with with the Hanukkah with the Jewish traditions around Hanukkah, or even just the pagan traditions around the celebration of light and the, you know, the solstice and all those. But there's so many things that we can as human beings that we, what are good rituals traditions that will help us be grounded into the essence of the season. Oh, I love how you said that. So it sounds as if it's connection connection mm -hmm. with families which we're all going to be doing in the next few weeks <laughs> um and it's the familiarity of the traditions that we've been brought up with that give us that sense of meaning i would imagine yes there's a lot of pressures around the, as you well know around these you know because everyone has to have their holiday festivities their parties you know, there's a lot of social expectations and demands, people's times. And then there's all these expectations around gifts. Okay. Yes. And gifts, gifts go back to just the really the essence of the season. When, you know, if we go look from the Christian tradition where God became a gift to us, right? And then we have the shepherds who bring gifts, and then the three magi, the three kings who bring gifts. So that's that's really where the gifts come from. Okay. Right? And that was made more popular by someone called Saint Nicholas, right? Which then became Santa Claus. Okay, and so giving uh, it, gifts to the children. It was right. in Germany, wasn't right, it? But it all go, yeah, it was. But it all goes back to the whole sense of this of God who becomes a gift for us, okay. right? Rather than human beings being a gift, seeing ourselves as a gift for God, right? What can we do for God? So it's a whole reversal, and so and it's something so beautiful. But we can get all hung up in in the giving of material gifts, and it's I suppose to what you're saying as well around the essence of the season is. Well, really, what's the greatest gifts that I can give those close to me, to my loved ones? And that might be reflected in something material, but the gift could be something a lot deeper. Mm. And I think that can just get thrown. It's a transition when somebody you love dies. Mm hmm especially a spouse or a parent or anybody in the immediate family that you were used to celebrating the holiday times with them. So they're losing their loved one. They're losing the familiarity of the season. How can they get back to being okay with the day and allowing themselves to mourn? Yes. I think again, there's some. I think some just practices that people can develop. But they have to be very intentional because people don't usually think about them. The fact is, is that a loss. When we lose a loved one, there's always be there will always be a hole. Nothing can replace that hole, that space. Mm -hmm. But there will always be a wound, if we could say it like that. And it's about honoring that space. That space has a name. That hole in our lives has a name, and we must always be able to, to name it especially around the holiday season. Now there's, and I'm, I'm just thinking here out loud, there could be these, these customs or rituals or traditions that families have where they have maybe a place at the table that's empty that has the names of the loved ones that, that are not with us. And you could add names to that every year. And it's a reminder. There's, mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, visit a loved one, if it's a close loved one who at the cemetery around, you know, either Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Again, it's but it's a dose of reality, reality, but it's so there's so much depth and importance there of visiting the loved ones, you know, even though they're you know, just where their remains are, because this is, as human beings, it's a sort of a place that reminds us of of our loved yeah. ones. But having something like some something meaningful, something symbolic that we do for our loved ones, rather than sort of just silence, right? Not dealing with I think naming people having things in the house that we have uh, candles that we light to remember 
those loved ones places at the table or it could be just one place that symbolizes many of our loved ones that we love things like that okay what about people that may be totally on their own now and feeling very isolated mm -hmm. and alone how can they find the essence of the holidays well there's, there's a few things that come to mind one is i think in this in this this could be misunderstood as very harsh on my end, but if they're going through the loneliness, then I think they could find by reading the Christmas story in its okay. authenticity, they could find some companionship and solace in that. Maybe stepping into a church, any type of church, right? Visiting the you know the nativity scene, or you know the, the and, and sort of saying, all right, this is very similar to what I'm going through. I feel rejected. Mary and Joseph felt rejected. They were alone, right? I'm on my own, right? This is it's a lonely time of year for me when everyone else is so happy. And I think we can find a lot of spiritual consolation and solace and meaning in that. That won't take away that human sensation, mm -hmm. but it's really what we do with it. Okay. Right, really? And then the other thing is, for those who 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 are not alone, I think it's so important, again, and it requires intentionality in a very busy season about visiting those that are alone. We think of hospitals, we think of nursing homes, we think of orphanages, we think, you know, or we think of just cousins or relatives that we might have that maybe we haven't seen in a while, they live on their own somewhere, you know, are we inviting them to, you know, maybe those uncomfortable family members or relatives that no one really wants, to have, whatever it is. <laughs> But yeah. if Christmas, and we're living the essence of the holiday season, well, this is the time to bring people into our home or to go visit them, bring them the warmth of love, even if we might not get what we expect in return. It's not about getting what we expect in return. It's about giving, you know, and bringing that to people, and visiting people, family members, whatever, you know, elderly that we might have, extended family, and who knows, maybe we haven't visited them in a long time, we haven't heard from them. And so around this time, we make a special effort to to go visit, to show that we do love and that we do care. Okay, so go visit. Uh, reach out to others is what I'm hearing you say. So that, because that's part of the belonging and the connection, isn't it? It is, Being and it's so much about what we, what, we, what we say we celebrate during this holiday season. Yeah. What... I know people who may have had a healthy religious belief, they've attended church, and then the person that they love dies, and they all of a sudden turn that anger and dismay and turn away from all of that. They blame God and want nothing to do with it. It's almost as if they cut it all off. How would you counsel a person that you were aware of that had done that? Yes, that's that's a very deep question and for a very deep conversation. To simplify, it, it's it's very it's natural as human beings that we we want to place blame somewhere. And if we're told that God is good and all loving and all and all powerful and all of this, right? Then well, if, if God is so good, loving, and all-powerful, why did he let this happen? Why did God let this happen? Mm -hmm. And as human beings, we, we, we want to find play, where somewhere to place the blame. And okay. usually the divine or the God is, is a very easy one to, because it's sort of a one-way street. No, we, we won't get a, much of a response. So we'll just, <laughs> well, it, and there we get, and it's very natural, so I... I've dealt with a lot of people that are angry with God, and I've gone through my own my mom, and it's very it's understandable. And the first one that understands that is God. Mm. God understands that human beings we get hurt and we get angry, and that we can get angry with God because of the belief system that we might have around what God means. God is the first one that understands that and is very patient and is loving through that. And they won't hold that against us. And I say that to people because people feel like, oh, no, they feel bad. that they're... No, God's not going to hold this against you. He understands. God is the first one that understands this. So it's, I think, just allowing ourselves to, to go through that. But then also the more of a rational explanation I have is 
and it's helped a lot of people is that when God, you know, we all believe that human beings are free, right? And that we have this gift of freedom. Right? And so God, the divine, whatever, you know, the world exists and the world exists with the laws of nature. Human beings exist with natural law and with all the laws of nature. And God, because God is such a respectful God, he allows everything to function according to the laws of nature and according to human freedom. So the natural and so natural laws is that we get sick sometimes. Okay. Right? That natural disasters happen. So it's not that now if God didn't respect freedom, and this would become a different type of God, right? Is in other words, a God that dictates everything and has control of everything doesn't allow the laws of nature to do the thing, doesn't allow really human beings to be free, but really controls all of us like puppets, mm -hmm. which okay. we, which sometimes we would like to believe because it makes it easier, but that's the fact is that it's not true. And so, because we all have all experienced the freedom and we've all experienced the benefits of when someone uses their freedom for good, when someone loves, when someone does good, when someone is heroic and sacrificial. And we suffer the consequences when someone uses their freedom for ill, mm -hmm. to do ill, to do evil, to do what is bad, to make a poor decision. And it's the law, you know, cause and effect that we, there are consequences. Now, does God want certain things to happen? He does not. But because he respects our intelligence and our free will, he allows us to live our lives and reap the benefits, and but also suffer the consequences. Okay. You're right. It is very deep, isn't it? <laughs> yes. There's no simple answer. And this is something that the human person has struggled with for thousands of years. There's a lot of books going back to the ancient oh. Greeks and, and Romans around the problem of suffering and all through um, all through the centuries, people yeah. trying to grapple with the sense of suffering and why good things happened or why bad things happened to good people. Yes, exactly. So with what you said there i took um we have we have choice we have choice whether to stay in our anger in our blame or we can choose to look at it as you mentioned using the laws of nature we're all going to die mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that this person died right in our minds before their time but knowing humans we don't think that way we may eventually come to that conclusion eh, Matthew? and it takes we time have... yes it takes time and there's beauty in that time and beauty it doesn't always feel beautiful right but there's there's depth there's meaning there's purpose in that time and and so I think it requires a lot of patience and patience comes from a Latin word, which is sort of that ability to suffer over time, right? Mm. And with something, right? And so we grow so much through that. And so going through, and you, you know the grieving process better than I do, but you know, the people experience the anger, the rejection and all these other things. And it's part of the grieving process. Now we can get stuck in one of those steps and that's not really healthy for us as human beings. Yeah. But it, it's natural. It's not very natural. And I think it's just uh, to allow people to go through that and for, for our listeners to allow yourselves to go through that. Those those stages, which are not comfortable, but they're healthy stages when we when we go through them because it allows us to process things and to deal with things. And then we begin to place things where, in, their, in their proper place. We, yeah. we place the blame in its proper place and not sort of the misplaced blame, whether it be on other people, whether it be on myself, right? The survivor's guilt oftentimes is misplaced blame. Oh, God. Big um, time. Or oh. when we you know misplaced blame, we blame God mm -hmm. because we don't know who else to, who else to blame. It's a, it's very natural that that happens. And so I want your listeners to understand that that is natural and not to get all caught up in the guilt of feeling that. And the first one that understands that is God. And okay. but to work through it. 
because we all know at the same time, and it's all these paradoxes of the human experience, we all know that through suffering and grief and through by health, dealing with it in a healthy way, we grow so much as human beings. We do indeed. And it's through that suffering that there is the growth. I kind of have this picture in my mind of the grief being like a rough diamond in a washing machine. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me why that came into my mind. And the, the, the longer it's in the washing machine, it's almost like it's getting polished. Mm -hmm. And when somebody takes it out, it's smoother and it's more manageable. And that's how I like to sort of visualize grief when I'm processing yeah. it. Going back to this time of year, and I love that you presenced the fact that people are reminded to go through the grief, but it's very difficult. We're preparing for Christmas. We're carrying our grief. We're in malls. We're listening to the music. We're getting triggered. And I can only imagine for a lot of people at this time of year, their grief gets put on hold. Mm -hmm. How can those people come back to recognizing that they do need to go through it? Can they make time for the grief? Is there any understanding or ways you could make you could suggest that they could take care of the grief and prepare for the holidays at the same time yes like it goes i think goes from individual to individual circumstance and situation to circumstance and situation but the some people the easiest thing is to put grief on hold now we could discuss whether that's the healthier thing healthiest thing to do you know we as human beings we have that ability to sort of compartmentalize and so we put things in a little box and I'll deal with you later. And that's to our advantage many times, but also it can be to our detriment. So I, that's why I think each people have to sort of name and claim sort of what's what they're that whatever that grieving or that loss is in their life and what's the healthiest way to do to deal with it. Because also you have to show up for people. So if you're, you know, <laughs> if you're in this mental and emotional state that doesn't allow you to show up for people, then you have to kind of make a choice. Well, am I going to sort of put this away in a box for a bit? so that I can show up for people, or am I going to show up as a basket case and just let people deal with it, or am I just going to avoid people for the time being and, and deal with what I'm going through? Those are all personal choices that people have to make. Yeah. But we go back to what I was saying before, is I think it's important to name things. And this is something that we have a hard time doing as human beings. Right? And we're going to put on this facade that everything's great, and we're we're strong, and we're doing well, and we we haven't lost anyone or anything. Yeah. You know, for the, And but that's not really... Honest either. That's why I think these symbols are so important that, you know, something in the house, something at a festivity that symbolizes an absence or mm -hmm. a loss. I think that's just, it's very powerful and that can be, that can be consoling and helpful and healthy. Okay. I keep losing my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's so there's so many things that we can talk about, right? In your... I know, I know. Okay, I, it came back to me. It's a good job I'm the editor. <laughs> <laughs> what you were saying about people may feel embarrassed about being out in public and crying, so they isolate, and that isn't something that's going to help them deal with it because they're going to feel even more lonely, aren't they? So I love how that. You, you brought that up. So how might you counsel? This is putting your priest hat on again. How might you counsel somebody that is embarrassed to be out in public? So is isolating. It is. I think it's it's adjusting appropriately. You have to, you know, with each, again, each individual is different. So, you know, how yeah. helpful is isolation in, in this moment of your life? Is it maybe just a a holiday celebration that just at a different size, different level, right? Minimizing things, but with, but in the company of loving people, mm. or is it, um, you know, leaning into the, the festivities, 
but with your grief, you know, so going to celebrations or going to church services, but bringing your loss with you because that's part of the grieving process and the reconciling yeah. process. I just, yeah, I'm not, I think avoidance, while it's natural for us as human beings, it's not always the, uh, the healthiest, the most appropriate. Yeah. Answer. Well, we don't want to be in pain, do we? We, we don't. We don't. We don't anyway, then we don't. Taught. If we don't, out of respect for others, we don't want to bring our pain to others. But if we really, if people really love us, then they'll understand if we're bringing that loss with us, and they'll they'll give you a you know an extra special hug and and a, an, a, an extra word. Now, a lot of us we don't want to be a burden for others, and that's why we also might opt for isolation. Well, I don't want people to be worried about me. But again, but I think those are distorted thoughts because no one would ever consider someone who's grieving as a burden, at least the people that love you. Exactly, exactly. Now, going back to your military service, that's got to be a very lonely time for the families that are left behind while their spouse is overseas. What's been your experience? I'm, I'm certain you had many service men and women come to you with that dilemma. I'm really missing my person my family at home and how do i do my job because right. the military so, doesn't have necessarily a holiday it's usually 24 right, yes. days, you, it? it's about a lot of people get do get the time off but oftentimes you have to be depending on your job you have to be on duty on, on christmas on the holiday or whatever it is you know and and then if you're deployed well then you're deployed during the holiday season mm-hmm I think, you know, when you do that over a period of years, you just become used to it. Okay. But I think the people that don't get used to it are the, is the family, mm. right? If the spouse or the, the mom or dad or the parents um, have to work or one of them has to, you know, be away on Christmas or deployed on Christmas. And it's better if they're deployed in a place, of, in an area of danger or violence, even more, mm. you know, it definitely takes the can suck the, the the joy out of the season or the innocent joy out of the season right there can be a heaviness about it um now the military because thankfully with communications and everything you know it's it's made it a lot easier where you can communicate people with you know it was not like decades ago where that was not possible you know where, where the writing would take weeks wouldn't right it? where there was a letter or this or that or, and so you didn't know right and there was a lot of unknown nowadays it's it's a little different so, so I think that that's helpful, but the, the fact is, is that and then families, I think some families just, or people, service members get used to it. The fact that it's year after year, that this is part of what they do and who they are. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't say that ever, you know, it's, it never becomes something that's easy. And now for me, you know, my own experience of ministry, although my time in service in the military wasn't, you know, it was just a few years, but in my ministry, you know, I, I went I'm not sure, 25 years without, I wasn't I mean, home for Christmas for 25 years. It was about spending time with people that you serve or with your community and things like that. And I was okay. over, and that was, but I, you also just got used to that. But I, I think in my case, probably I, I was, was not very thoughtful about how that affected my loved ones at home. Okay. What that meant for them. And I missed a lot of important celebrations you know, siblings' weddings and things like that. and But also just thinking around the Christmas or the holiday season, not being, you know, I just became, it just became normal that I was not there. And, okay. and I'm not sure how that affected them. And I was just living my life and doing my thing. <laughs> so I probably could have been much more aware and sensitive to that. Isn't that interesting? And I think that's what happens in our younger years. We're so busy living our own lives. How, with our friends, especially if we're in other countries, you tend not to think about the ones you've left behind. Right. And how, how they may be feeling. Mm-hmm. Have you ever reached out to your siblings and had that conversation, Matthew? I don't think so. But there were a few of us in ministry, so there were a few of us that were doing the same thing. <laughs> okay. So I, they were all possibly, or a few yeah. of them were feeling the same way. No. So the but- family would get used to it i would imagine yeah but there's a conversation to be had with one of my sisters because i i was in seminary and i couldn't go to her wedding because of the rules and 
And that's something I've never talked to her about because I, I think that was probably hurtful, even though they were always very understanding and supportive. But it, I imagine that's the conversation to be had. Okay, stay tuned. We'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> so for the for people overseas, it's just something that they get used to or they learn to get used to it. They make their, their own Christmas essence and festivities, I would imagine, eh? They do, yes. They try to make it work, you know, in their own community. And the, the militaries can be a very tight-knit community. So I think what makes it tight-knit is, is that they go through difficulties together. Okay. And so that brings people together. So they're all going through the same thing in, in, you know, in a very specific way. And so that brings them together. So they're able so to service to... families would be able to mingle with other families. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of those services on bases, you know, for those the families that stay back and for those that are deployed, well, then they that it's a bonding. It's a reason to really bond in a deeper way that we're suffering. We're going through this together. Okay. I it doesn't necessarily fill the void, but but it can strengthen the the the, the celebration. That somebody else is going through a the similar feelings that right. you're experiencing and you've got somebody that understands and you can mm -hmm. talk to about, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to let you take your priest hat off for the moment, if you right. would, <laughs> and let's go to workplace. <laughs> yes. How can, um, it's got to be a really difficult, um, Leadership has to be so challenging these days. How do you help leaders navigate the festivities? They may be grieving themselves. They've got their own emotions. And how can you help them? Or how do you help them find their own joy? As well as knowing that there may be employees that are, are grieving as well. Yes, a lot, oh, isn't it? It's a lot. It is a lot. And it's, you know, when you're in those service positions of leading, you know, you're serving others when you're all you're worried about others, you're concerned about others. It's um, oftentimes it, not a whole lot of time to deal with your own stuff, right? Which would have been my case for decades, you know, hence okay. you know, the part of what we've talked about, my own story. So it it is very important that people are able to name stuff, claim stuff, take time on their own, mm -hmm. especially if they're grieving. But, uh, you know, let's go back a little bit to, you know, how in how do leaders, and there is, I think in a lot of corporate organizations, there again, there's these holiday parties and festivities and they get together. But you also just want to, you know, I don't know, I think there's a lot of pressures. You know, is the workplace, does the workplace really have to provide that? I don't, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, sometimes we, we put a lot of expectations on the workplace to do all these things. And... So you can go to the holiday. And, but again, it's just I think it's a very important that each workplace and leader find the, the, the meaningful way to celebrate whatever it is meant to be celebrated. And as you said, I think it is such an insightful question is to, as, as a leader and in the workplace or the organizational environment, how what are we doing to, to remember that some people are grieving, that some people that maybe used to be here are not here anymore, that some of your loved ones are no longer around right? and how can we honor that and i i would suppose i don't have data to go back this up but i would suppose that that doesn't happen very often mm -hmm. that that's not a common message in in holiday celebrations and, and i think it, it it would organizations would do well to be more intentional about that yeah it's, well it sort of buys into the the, the culture of Okay, December, we're coming up for Christmas. We've all got to be jolly and happy and giving and kind right. when you're stressed to the hilt and you're trying to do your job as a leader, but you're going through your own stuff. Do you find that they tend to share? I'm going with the, the leaders that you've worked with. Do they share these with their teams or do they tend to be very stoic and keep any losses to themselves? Well, I think it's, yeah, you, you, they would normally, the natural choice would be to be more stoic, put on the mask, put on the facade, really because, because I want to take care of my people. 
right? And so I want to make this about them. This is not about me. And so I put my things on the back burner. That's why I think this is just a huge problem, not only with human beings, but with, with people in leadership roles, whether it be religious ministry roles or whether it be in military leadership roles or whether it be in the corporate world or other organizations is yeah, there's this pressure and I, and I, it's understandable that I, cause you don't want to burden your followers or your people with all of your pain. Um, but I think, you know, just being able to, again, name things, bring things up. I think it's, it's important because you're also giving your people permission to do the same. Exactly. You, I would imagine, become known then as a more empathetic and compassionate leader when you can share. You don't have to share everything, but right. just share this is what I'm going through because then you would find that others would support you and be more willing to share what's heavy on their own hearts, I would well, imagine. Yes. Yes, and you know, you you bringing this up brings to my, some moments when I was I was in leadership roles, and during the the Christmas season, I would have you know it was just tradition that I, the leader, or the director, of the of the community would share um, reflections, holiday reflections, mm -hmm. and there were a few years where I shared some of the troubles or like what I was going or mistakes that I'd made during the year, sort of like it, you know. I'm not sure how appropriate that was, but I did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I maybe I could have done it in a better way. But anyway, the fact is I did it and I got emotional about it a few times. Um, it maybe have made my followers uncomfortable, but hopefully it also allowed them to connect with, with what they were, to deal with their own humanity, you know, yeah, their own fragility and whatever they might be going through. And what you just mentioned is is real people are not comfortable with emotions so <laughs> do you be the one that is you know leading and showing this is who i am in all my messy moments yes you're going to be uncomfortable but hopefully they can get past it and see what it is you were perhaps teaching them by doing right. that, yes, I think the word "appropriate" is very important because it's a very it's just a fine line of that we do it in a professional, appropriate manner that's real, but that does turn into a whole session where I'm just burdening all my people with all of my stuff because that's not appropriate either. Yeah, it's sharing a little bit, but allowing people to respond and sure. open up. If if they yes. they need it, that's where I was sort of going. Of course, not in an appropriate, measured manner, and in a real people really appreciate that. But I think it just balance is really important, and because and you can do that, people can you can express you know that rawness of the human experience, whatever I'm going through, but in a balanced way where I'm not burdening it with it, I'm I'm sharing, and this creates a deeper connection. Exactly, there's more intimacy, isn't there? Yes whether that's appropriate in the workplace. But again, that's another, another right. topic for another day. But what I mean is it creates intimacy in terms of connection, people to people, when you share a little bit about what's going on for you. Yes. And appropriateness, again, it changes from context to context. So there is an appropriate way to do that in a professional context. Yeah. Wow. We have covered the whole gamut. Now let me see. <laughs> finding the essence of the holidays <laughs> hopefully you have found listeners a, a little nugget in each one that we've sort of gone through and in Matthew's story of where and how it all began regardless of whether you're a Christian or celebrating Hanukkah or the solstice or mm -hmm. whatever holiday it is I think there's an element a thread of truth of perhaps the lights that can connect us, the simplicity, bringing it back to the simplicity of, of the season, I think potentially could help so many of us who our stress levels go through the, the roof. All right, what would be your final words? <laughs> 
Final words. Uh, you know, and we were talking about the season of light, really, and this goes way back even before before Christianity, right? Because of the solstice, you know, the 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 21st of December and all this. And I, when I lived in Ireland, we visited a place called Newgrange. And if any of you ever go to Ireland, please visit that because it's fascinating. You know, of people, I can't remember how long, how far back that goes, but how they were able to find these huge boulders, right? And put the, but the, the amazing, the, the message here is, and I think this is important for what we're, for our conversation is, they designed something in such a way, right? So inside of these huge monuments at Newgrange, in the middle is where they would lay the rests, um, the, the the remains of those that had died. Okay. And on the 21st of December, the sun would rise in such a way it would in it would peep through this hole that was in this construction, in the, this construct. And the sun would shine all the way down this hallway that was designed like this. And the sunbeams would land on the remains of the dead mm-hmm. only on the 21st of December. First of all, just how they design that. But, but I think what, but the message here is to allow light to shine on our losses mm. and on our pain. And, and we're celebrating the light and in the context of our conversation is to allow the light to shine on those, those difficult moments, those painful moments, those losses that we have. And that that image of Newgrange is something that just comes to me in a very powerful way during this season, of a of of the way those people did that. Yeah, when you think without any necessarily instruments as we have today or computers, that they could calculate that the sun would come through that one small space, and absolutely illuminate. Right. And when that happened, the message for them, you know, without knowing everything that we know now, is the message for them was that spring is going to come. Hope is around the corner. We've made it through the darkest day. And that's a powerful message for your listeners today, for those that might be grieving, that spring will come through the, the winter. Matthew, that is beautiful. I'm not going to add anything else. (laughs) Listeners, I hope you will take that message to heart. If you are grieving, it's the darkest time, but spring is coming. The light is returning. Thank you, Matthew, for spending time with us today and going into those places. Yes. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to all your listeners. That's a wrap, listeners. Until next time, this has been a special holiday holiday episode, and uh, I'm wishing everybody well, and we'll return in the new year. Take care, everyone. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link, and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at Anne at Understanding Grief. Dot com, or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>